let your requests be made known to God. Our brother Ed and I have been talking a lot about prayer lately, and especially, and we do a, a weekly internet radio program, and in that program we've been talking about this, uh, sharing personal testimonies, things that other people, requests that other people have made, uh, prayers that they've asked, certain things, um, and, and it's just an abundance of different things that, that you can pray for that sometimes we might not even think about. And we have special time right here, just a few moments ago. Brother Rick prayed for, what, 15 minutes maybe? For people that needed prayer, pre people that had specific requests. And so we, we pray to God, and he answers those prayers. Now, some may not be answered the way we think they should be or the way that we want them to be, but if you take time to reflect back and look back on your life, so many times you'll see things where he has answered prayers, and until you stop and think about it, you might not even realize it. That's happened to me so many times. I would pray for something, I would ask for something, and then I I'm, don't think about it anymore, and then when I look back, I say, wait a minute. That prayer was answered at this moment or at that moment. I know that's happened to us. It's happened to me so many times. So what I thought we would do this morning, since, since this has been the topic, that, the theme that we've had in the radio program, I thought it might be nice to talk about letting your requests be made known to God. Now, I don't know if you knew this or not, but there are, about, there are over 600 prayers listed in the Bible. Over 600. It's pretty amazing when you think about that. And if you study them, you'll find that over 400, about 450 prayers have, were answered directly. You see that they were answered. It's pretty interesting when you study these things and you go through. So we see that God hears prayers, and then you'll see in the Bible that many of them were answered. Now, sometimes they might not have been answered immediately. It might have been later on. Sometimes we read things in, Bible, in the Bible and we don't realize, oh, wait a minute. You go back and you say, well, this was the answer here. So there are hundreds of prayers in the Bible and hundreds of them have been answered. The, the Bible records Jesus praying over 20 different times during his earthly ministry. Over 20 times it records him praying. And in the Bible, the Apostle Paul mentions prayer he mentions prayers, prayer reports, prayer requests, exhortations to pray. He talks about all of these different things. And he does this 41 times if you study what Paul has written. And some of these things you can look up just by doing a simple word search. You can just type in the word pray or prayer or praying, prayer request. You can type those things into a word search on a Bible program like uh, I, I use either Bible Gateway or eSword, and on my phone I use, um, it's a New King James Bible, and you can just do those searches and come right up with those things, and you can look at those prayers individually and those requests. They're so encouraging to read. I, I want to encourage you in your personal study to look at those things. If your prayer life lacks, if you lack a prayer life, look at these things and look at some of the things that happened as a result. I'm going to be honest with you. In my lifetime, my prayer life was basically mealtime. <laughs> I would thank God for food. And then when you went to church, you would pray. But individual prayer, I didn't really have until I really started wanting to know who God is and who his son is. And once I started wanting that relationship, that prayer life grew. So if you want a prayer life, ask God to give you a better prayer life. You can ask him for that. So let's look at some of these examples of prayers in the Bible. Let's just, let's just begin in Ephesians chapter 1 with what Paul says. Some of these examples of using the word prayer or prayers or reports, things like that. Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at an abundance of Scripture today because we're talking about talking with God. God talks with us through the pages of his Bible, but we talk with him through the avenue of prayer. So Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm just going to begin in verse 15. Notice 
what this says. This is Paul. He says, therefore, I also, after, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus to prove and, and prove your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my, what? In my prayers. So Paul was praying for people, just, just like we should. We should pray for people. That in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand and in the heavenly places. For above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, this is only two sentences <laughs> in Paul's writing. He had what we would call today run-on sentences, but he says so much. In his prayer, he was praying for these people. He was praying that they would know Christ. He was praying that they would understand the gospel. He prays over and over again as you look through Bible texts. And all prayer, when you think about it, I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, people pray at different times. Um, you've often heard me say that sometimes my prayers come when I'm walking, if I walk in the mornings or in the evening. When I'm driving, you know, driving, if you're just driving along, so many people just turn on the radio and, and really... Most of us just listen to garbage on the radio. There's really not much good to listen to unless you find a good broadcast somewhere. But driving time is a time to pray. We might think, well, you're supposed to close your eyes when, you're pray when you pray, but I don't recommend that when you're driving or walking. You can pray with your eyes open, with your eyes closed, with your hands folded. You can pray in just about any type of position you can imagine. And the, and the Bible lists a number of postures. Let's just take a look at some of those. Here on the PowerPoint, I'm just going to, we're just going to look at some very quickly here on the PowerPoint. 2 Samuel 7, 18, it says, Then King David went in and sat before Jehovah. And he said, Who am I, O Lord Jehovah? And what is my house that you have brought me here? So here he's praying in the sitting position. He's sitting and praying. You can also stand when you pray. We can see that here in Mark chapter 11. It says, and whenever you stand praying, Jesus is speaking here, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. We're putting the focus on the posture. You can sit, you can stand praying. Also, this is one that we do. We, we sit here when we prayed today. When I said this uh, prayer right before the sermon, you were sitting. We stand when we prayed today. When, after we sang the opening hymn, we stood and prayed. Today, we did something else. We kneeled when we prayed today, when Brother Rick offered the intercessory prayer. We took time to kneel to pray. And here you go. This is very often spoken of in the Bible. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, let's just look at verse 13 and 14. This is the modern King James. It says, For Solomon had made a bronze scaffold, five cubits long and five cubits broad and three cubits high, and he had set it in the midst of the court, and he stood on it and kneeled down on his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he said, O oh, Jehovah, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or in earth. You keep your covenant and show mercy to your servants who walk before you with all their hearts. Now here, when we kneel for prayer, for some reason, I'm usually back behind the last pew. And I don't know why I do this. When we're kneeling, I clasp my hands and I bow my head. Some people go like this. Some people might not do that at all. Here, you have... You have Solomon kneeling, and he's 
lift, spreading his hands open toward heaven while he's kneeling. So there are so many different ways. In Daniel's day, when the governors and satraps had plotted against Daniel, they had King Darius sign a document or a law that the people could not petition God or man for 30 days. They didn't want them having any kind of petition. But notice what Daniel did. This is on the PowerPoint. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. It says, And when he had learned that the document was signed, Daniel went to his house, and his windows were open in his roof room toward Jerusalem. And he kneeled on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did before. So none of these prayers so far are at mealtime. <laughs> these prayers are at various times, sometimes in times of need, sometimes in times of desperation, sometimes to pray for others. Jesus also kneeled. We can see that here in Luke chapter 22. If you look at chap on the PowerPoint, this is from the New King James Version. It says, beginning in verse 41, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. There's power in prayer. Here, Jesus prays, and what happens? The angels come to help him. Friends, this can happen right now today with you. You can pray, and the angels will come, and they can comfort you. They can help you. We have actually prayed for the angels to direct surgeons when surgeons are operating on people. We said, put your angels around the surgeon. Put your angels around the doctor. This is not an unusual thing. These angels, of course, it says, appeared to Jesus from heaven and they strengthened him. And that caused him to pray even more earnestly because he was hurting. So there's tremendous power in prayer. And kneeling can be a humbling experience. You know, when you kneel down, it's a vulnerable position because you can't just take off. You have to get up. And the older we get, the harder it is to get up. You know, when we're on our knees during that intercessory prayers for that long, I need a little pad. That would be... That's what I should do. But it can be humbling. It's very special. At the times of my life when I felt that I needed to reach God more than ever, I have kneeled. When I knew, when I learned the Sabbath truth for the first time, and I knew I was going to have to close my business, I kneeled and I prayed to God and I says, you're going to have to get me through this. When I knew that I was going to be leaving the church that I had grown up in all of my life, I kneeled and I prayed to God, I can't do this. I'm claiming the promise that you gave me. When I had to witness to somebody about who God is, and it was my first time ever going to the Bible alone and not depending on what I had learned from what I would learned all of my life, I kneeled and I prayed to God. And you know what? In every one of those instances, something special happened. Something special happened. I'll give you the last one the one where I kneeled and I prayed that God would help me to be able to reveal to this person that asked me what I believed, who God truly is and who his son is. I got on my knees and I prayed. And it was within three, it was, that was on a, a Sabbath afternoon. So it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I'm on my way home from work and that's when it came to me. God answered that prayer with an abundance of scripture to answer that question. And the following week, I went to that brother's house and I told him, I'm glad you asked me that question because I prayed about it and I believe something different now than I did when you asked me that question. Friends, I don't think that's possible without prayer. God answered that prayer. There are others in the Bible who prayed and they kneeled. Let's just Take a, a quick glance at a couple of these. Acts chapter 7. And I know we're going to cover this in our Sabbath school, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. We'll be coming up to this. I don't know when, but it, it doesn't matter. Acts chapter 7. And uh, let's just take a look here. Let's see. Acts chapter 7. Oops. 
might help if I get to the right place. Acts chapter 7, and here we have uh, Stephen, and, and one of his seven chosen deacons gives a, a scathing sermon. Actually, he's one of the seven chosen deacons there. You can see that in verse chapter 6 if you read it. And he gives a scathing sermon. And in verse 54 of, I think it's chapter 7, in verse 54, we're not going to read through this account. I, I'm going to expect that you have some background on it and who Stephen was and what he did and the sermon that he preached and the things that he said. And beginning in verse 54, they all heard these things. Actually, um, yeah, we'll just start there. When they heard these things, the things that Stephen was saying to them, they were cut to the heart. This is verse 54 of Acts chapter 7. They were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Then he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened up or opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. So that they're, they don't want to hear him. So they're plugging their ears and they're screaming while they're running at him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. They stoned Stephen in verse 58. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. This young man named Saul is the one who eventually became the apostle Paul, who we just read about in Ephesians. And in verse 59, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In other words, he died. He died. So here, in all of this turmoil, what does he do? It says in verse 60, he knelt down and cried with a loud voice. So he's praying, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Could you imagine getting pelted with stones and praying to not, not do that, to not hurt these people? Don't charge them with what they're doing. This was a godly man. This was a man who obviously had a prayer life because without prayer, you don't do this. If you haven't had a prayer life, you're not going to do this at that moment. It would be, Lord Jesus, take these people away. But no, he said, don't charge them with this sin. This was a man who understood who God is. It understood who God's son is. I want you to notice in Acts, if you turn to chapter 9 also, Acts chapter 9, uh, just briefly, beginning in verse 36. These are just instances of people kneeling for prayer and the power that's in the prayer and the, the relationship that they must have had with God. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 36, it says that Joppa, there was a certain, uh, a, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But when it happened in those days that she became sick and died, when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near, to, was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him imploring him to not delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room and all the windows, uh, yes, and all the, window, all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. And notice verse 40. But Peter put them all out. And what did he do? He knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand, and he lifted her up, and when she had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. He knelt down. Now, let's not make a mistake here. Peter did not resurrect this person. It was the prayer that he said, the Spirit of God resurrected this person. It shows the power of prayer. It shows that, you know, he, sure, he could have probably stood there, but it's a humbling thing to get on your knees and say a prayer. 
and asked for God to do something. He knelt down and prayed. And then notice verse 42, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner. So this one act of faith, he prayed. He had to have faith that this was going to happen. He must have known that God somehow was going to answer his prayer. It happened immediately. Do you pray with that kind of faith? You know, sometimes I pray thinking, I don't know if this is really going to happen. I don't know if this is even possible. But if we have the faith of a mustard seed, right? The faith of a mustard seed, that little tiny bit of faith, miracles can happen. In Acts chapter 20, Paul calls the church elders together before he leaves them. And if you notice here, I've got it on the PowerPoint, or you can turn there in your Bible if you like. Acts chapter 20 Verses 35 through 38 here on the PowerPoint, it says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the, wor for the words that which he spoke that they would see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. So here he was leaving, and he kneels down and prays with these people. And it's really, it's an amazing thing. And the account continues in Acts chapter 21. If you just take a look, I, I love this account. Acts chapter 21, notice what it says here, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass that when he had departed from them, to set sail, running a straight course, he came to Kos. And, and I'm sorry, the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard to set sail. And when we incited Cyprus, when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there was a ship and her cargo. I'm sorry, for there, there the ship was to unload her cargo. So that's interesting. They called the ship her even back then. You ever notice ships usually have a female name? I'd never noticed that until just now. <laughs> that kind of threw me there. In verse 4 it says, And finding disciples, finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When they had come to the end of those days, we departed and went to went on our way, and they accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we, what did they do? They knelt down right on the shore, right in the sand, right there. They knelt down and prayed. They knelt down and prayed right on the shore, wherever you are. It might have looked odd to some people. It might have seemed crazy. What's that man doing, kneeling down on the shore? We don't know. But he knelt down and prayed right there. And there are a number of places, and I don't know that we're going to look at all of these, but in Ephesians chapter 3, there is a type of intercessory prayer. Let's just take a look at that real quick. Let's just take a look. Ephesians chapter 3. I have tons of scriptures, and I, I don't know that I, we have time to read them all. And some of them are very touching, and some of them are, are just to point out how these things take place. Ephesians chapter 3. It's really not very long, but if you take a look particularly at... Let's just start in verse, in verse 1. It says, For this reason I, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you, for you Gentiles... If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery that I have, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. 
that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you think Paul did this without prayer? I don't think so. He had to pray. And to make all see, verse 9, what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ Jesus to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. In verse 14, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and think according to the power that works in us, To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So whether we sit or we stand, intercessory prayer, he was praying for people here. This is what we did here. This is what we can do as a group. This is what you can do as an individual. Pray for people. Pray for them. Take down their list. We have a sister, Lori, who has a tremendous list of people that she prays for every single day. And those prayers are being answered. Maybe not exactly the way we think they should be, but in retrospect, prayers are answered. So whether we sit, we stand, we kneel, or any other way we pray, I want you to notice there's another way that Jesus prayed. And this is in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, the Gospel of John. In verses 1 through 5, if you just scan this chapter, John chapter 17, in verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays for himself. And then in verses 6 through 19, he praises, prays for his disciples. Are we his disciples? Yes. And then he prays for ones who will eventually believe. In other words, people who don't yet believe, but will believe. And we find that in John chapter 7, verses 20 through 20, or 17 rather, verses 20 through 26. My Bible, I was in John chapter 7 rather than 17. That's what happens when I try to talk and multitask turning to Scripture. So in John chapter 17, he prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, he prays for those who did not yet believe. So in other words, people that we're witnessing to, people who don't, know the gospel yet. And Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane we find in Matthew chapter 26. So take a look there. I'm just, I'm getting you to turn to these so that you can, you can look at these texts in your spare time. I hope you take time to study these things because there's so much information here. There's so many things of the hundreds of prayers. Matthew chapter 26. And I'm just going to start in verse 36. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. He He wanted to go over and pray. He wanted to be alone for a moment. So he says, you sit here. I'm going to go pray over there. In verse 37, it says, he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply depressed. So it's interesting to me when we look at this, watch what happens. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrow, even to death. 
Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and started praying. He didn't just kneel. He fell on his face. Some would call this prostrate. You fall prostrate. Laying face down sometimes on the ground. He was really troubled. He knew what had happened. He knew what was going to happen. This was troubling him. He was about to bear the sins of the world. So there it says, he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So when I look at this, there are so many prayers in the Bible. There are so many. And the prayers of Jesus, he teaches us so much. You know, there's a few more prayers, uh, things that we can pray for, and then we're going we're gonna to take a look at a couple of things here. First uh, Timothy chapter 2. Turn with me there. Uh, you would not believe how much I cut because there were just so many things. This, this could have been probably a six or eight part series, but I just wanted to kind of just do an overview. First Timothy chapter 2, and look at beginning in verse 1. It says, therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in, the, in faith and truth. So I want you to notice those opening, that opening verse. I exhort, first of all, that supplications, that's a request, that requests, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. We should be praying even for people, like it says here, for kings who are in authority, for the leaders of the world. We should be praying for them. Boy, this world needs that prayer now more than ever. They really do. Now, this is a prayer that I really appreciate in 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. This was Solomon. Solomon had a prayer. And I, I don't know how familiar you are with this. I think most of us are pretty familiar with this. But 1 Kings chapter 3. We're going to read quite a few verses here because I want you to get the context of what was taking place. Solomon was... Um, well, you'll see. You'll see who, who he is as we, go through, as we go through this. In chapter 3, verse 1, we're not going to read the whole chapter. We're just going to scan through this uh, about halfway through, maybe a little better. It says, Now Solomon made a treaty with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married Pharaoh's daughter. Then he brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of Jehovah and the wall all around Jerusalem. Now remember, Solomon is was King David's son, okay? He was King David's son. David wasn't allowed to build the temple because of the blood on his hands. So this, this is Solomon, the David's son. Verse 2, Meanwhile, the people sacrificed at the high places because there was no house built for the name of Jehovah until those days. And Solomon loved Jehovah, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. Now the king went to Gib Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, Jehovah appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? So here God is asking Solomon, What do you want? Most people today, what do you think they would ask for? What do you want exactly? They would want money. 
That's what they would ask for. It's a shame, but that's what they would ask for. Let's see what happens here. Verse 6, And Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth in righteousness and an uprightness of heart with you. You have continued his great kindness for him, this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Jehovah my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David. But I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant, this is his request, therefore, give to me, as Solomon is saying, he's asking for, he says, give me understanding, an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours. This was not a selfish request. This was not selfish. He was asking that he would be able to help these people. That was his request. He wanted understanding. Verse 10, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any like, anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways, I want you to notice there's an if there. It doesn't say, so no matter what. It says, so if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. God has requirements. We may pray for something, but if we're not working according to our prayer, this goes right back to the things that we were talking about in Sabbath school, about in, in Ananiah and Sapphira. Don't promise something that you're not going to try to follow through. If you walk in my ways, verse 14, to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will strengthen your days. Then Solomon awoke, and indeed, it had been a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah, offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. So Solomon became what we know as one of the wisest men, the wisest man who ever lived. I would say Jesus was the wisest man, but Solomon was the wisest man, according to this. So we can ask for wisdom. What a great thing to ask for. It seems that whenever we study, the prayer always seems to be, give us understanding, give us wisdom. Right? Isn't that what we should pray for whenever we study? Of course. So we can ask for uh, prayers of help. You find that in Psalm 25. Let's just take a look briefly. Just a few more verses here. A few more verses we want to look at. Psalm 25. So this, actually, Psalm 25, is, this is by, written by David's father, or Sol Solomon's father. And this is what it says, Psalm 25, in verse, beginning in verse 1. It says, You, O Jehovah, to you, O Jehovah, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Jehovah. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. This is, this is not only a song. This is a prayer. This is a prayer. What a beautiful prayer he's praying. 
He's asking for truth. He's asking for guidance. He's asking for God to teach him. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I will wait all day. In other words, it doesn't matter how long it takes. I will wait. Remember, O Jehovah, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me. So he's asking to forgive me the things that I've done for your goodness sake, O Jehovah. It says in verse 8, good and upright is Jehovah. Therefore, he teaches sinners the way. So he's praising God. He's petitioning God. It says in verse 9, the humble he guides in justice and the humble he teaches his way. Who is the way, the truth, and the life? It's Jesus. All the paths of Jehovah are mercy and truth. So we see the way listed here. We see truth listed here. To such as keep his covenant and his testimony. For your name's sake, O Jehovah, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. See, David realizes his sins. And he's asking for forgiveness. Verse 12, who is the man that fears Jehovah? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of Jehovah is with those who fear him. It's not saying that they can't understand it. They can understand it. And he will show them his covenant. He reveals it to them. My eyes are ever toward Jehovah, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look on my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with a cruel hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Do you really trust God? Do we have this kind of trust? Do we believe that he's proactive and working in our lives? Can we see it? Do we see evidence of it? And if we don't, maybe we're just not looking close enough. Verse 21, let the integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Think about this. I wait for you. You know, there there is a prayer that I have been praying since 1996, since June 10th, 1996. I'm still waiting. But from time to time, I see little progress. Don't give up. If you've prayed a prayer and it hasn't been answered, you keep praying this prayer. You keep asking. Brother Ed just did just spoke about this not long ago. Keep asking. Ask, seek, knock. You, have, you don't just ask once. Keep on asking. You don't just seek one time. You keep seeking. You don't just... You keep knocking. Keep knocking. Don't give up. You know... This particular lecture, as I was going through these things, I was encouraged because I realized, can you imagine what these men of old, men and women of old, what they went through, the times that they went through? It had to be terrible, some of the things they had to endure. You know, David gives a prayer of mercy from a broken and sinful heart in Psalm 51. I know you know this text. Let's just turn there. Psalm 51. Keep praying, friends. Don't give up. Don't give up. Psalm 51. I don't know that we're going to read all of it. We we might just scan through this really quick. Psalm 51. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You know, part of the reason why sometimes our prayers may not be answered is because we're not living in accordance with our prayers. If I have a vice that I can't seem to get rid of, I have a friend, a dear friend, I don't, he's not with us anymore, his name was Butch, and he had this vice of smoking. Well, if he kept praying, help me to stop smoking while a cigarette's in his mouth, you know, let's at least take it out. 
You see? Be proactive. Work in accordance with your prayers. You, you, run, you run out of cigarettes. What do you do? Do you go to a store and pray while you're on your way? You can pray. Help me to stop smoking. Divert me from this journey. Take me away from that. Help me to not want it. Make it repulsive. Help me to be sick when I do this. There was a brother that prayed for me when I was in my former church. I didn't know this at the time, but I literally, there were certain things that would be said from, from the stage that would turn my stomach. And I shared that with him years later. I said, I would literally get sick on the stomach. And I, I'm not, when I say literally, I mean literally. I would get up and go in the back to the bathroom. And he said to me, oh, my prayers were answered. I prayed that every time you heard error, that you would get sick. Now, that sounds like a terrible prayer, but he was specific in his prayer. It, he wanted me to just feel it inwardly and know. It's amazing to me. I didn't know that until years later. And it was the man that I actually, it was the first man, that man that was at my shop that day that I opened up the Bible and I was going to show him the commandments. He was the one that had that prayer. And it worked. And I'm grateful for that now. Boy, at the time I wasn't. <laughs> but looking back, I can see that it worked. When you have time, friends, read the 51st Psalm. Read it. It is beautiful. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Read this Psalm. Read it. You can pray this prayer. And one last prayer I did want to look at. I don't think we can, we can read the Bible without looking at this prayer. And that is in Luke chapter 11. This is a prayer that Jesus prayed. In fact, you know, I've always gone to the one in Matthew uh, because there's a couple of different recordings of this account. And just the other day, Brother Ed and I were doing the program and he had me read this one. And um, I just wanted to point out a few things about this. Luke chapter 11, and I'm just going to start in verse 1. Now it came to pass as he, that's Jesus, was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So in this prayer, in, that, in those short words, Sometimes we just read the words and we don't think about what it's saying. But there are five areas that Jesus focused on. Five things. I want you to notice what they are. First of all, he says, Father in heaven, in verse 2. He wants God's name to be honored as holy. He says, hallowed be your name. God has a name. He wants that name. It doesn't say, hallowed be your title, hallowed be your name. Whether you call God Yahweh or Jehovah, it, I, don't, I don't know that it matters. I don't know that pronunciation matters so much. But people need to know that God has a name. If you talked about the Son of God all the time and you never said the name Jesus, how would people know the name of Jesus unless you used the name Jesus? If you just said the Son of God, so one of the things was his name is to be honored as holy. Number two, he's asking for God's kingdom to come. Number three, he's asking for daily bread, for food, for sustenance. Now that daily bread could be not only food, but it could also be what we take spiritually, the things that we learn. Also, it mentions God's forgiveness. Forgive us our sins. But what do we have to do in turn? We have to forgive others. That's the hard part. It's easy for me to ask God for forgiveness, but getting 
me to forgive somebody that's wronged me. That's, that's hard. And then number five, God's deliverance will be provided. That's what it says. Deliver us from the evil one. So Jesus was teaching them not to say necessarily these exact words, but these are, here's a, a list of things that you can pray about because they said, teach us how to pray. They wanted to learn. People today need to be taught how to pray because when I go and I visit other places, whether it's a funeral or a wedding or a church or whatever it is, there's confusion in the prayers. They'll start off praying to the Father. And then right in the middle of that prayer, they'll start saying how you came down and died for us. Who? The Father? No, we need to be specific. Be specific. Jesus was specific here. He prayed to his Father. No, Jesus is the one that came and died for us. The Father didn't. The Father is in heaven. Jesus is the one who came to this earth. But I hear this confusion in prayers constantly. And what does it do? If a preacher, a minister, a pastor, whoever prays that prayer, what does it do? People in the church begin to do that same prayer. They begin to use those words and choose those words. So be specific. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and dying for me. You see? Be specific. There's so much confusion in prayers. So much confusion. And what do you pray about? Well, we just saw what we pray about. Am I saying that God will not hear a prayer if there's confusion in it? I'm not. It depends on where we are. A pastor should know better. A pastor should know how to pray. A minister, a Bible study leader, they should know how to pray. We pray to the Father through the Son, we can thank the Son for what He has done, all of those things. So just think about who you're talking to. You're talking to the Most High in the universe. And sometimes people don't know at all how to pray. I know a man who didn't even know if he believed. He said he didn't really believe in God, and he was about to commit suicide, and he got on his knees, and he said, God, if you exist... If, if you exist, he didn't say, Father. He just said, God, if you exist, please help me. And somebody rang his doorbell. Now, while I may not agree with all of the theology of the people who rang his doorbell, that saved his life. And he learned who God is. And he learned that God has a son. And his theology might have been wrong, but he was grateful that was an answer to his prayer. I believe that. God can use anyone, any church, any person, any minister to reach you. So think about these things. Think about the prayers of Jesus. Think about the prayers that we've considered. We've seen that the Bible lists several different types of prayers. And James chapter 5, 15, we find the prayer of faith. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see corporate prayer. In Psalm 95, 2 and 3, we see the prayer of thanksgiving. In Acts chapter 13, 2 and 3, we have the prayer of praise and worship. In Matthew 26, 39, you have a prayer of consecration, also known as a prayer of dedication. And in 1 Timothy 2, 1, you have the intercessory prayer or prayer of intercession. So these are just different types of prayers. They can all be together. They can be individually. You can have a personal prayer life. So that brings us back to our scripture reading. This is where we got the, the title of the sermon from, which is, Let Your Requests Be Known to God. Philippians chapter 4, our last scripture, verses 4 through 7, from the New King James Version, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. I, I'm sorry, it's, it's hard for me to read that and not think of the scripture song that we sing. So rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is, the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Prayer is a gift from God. When we pray, it not only shows God that we have faith in him, that we believe in him, that we trust in him, that we know he exists, but it shows people around us. It gives them an example. Just like Jesus, he taught his disciples how to pray. We can teach people to have a prayer life. It's how we communicate with God. It's how we talk with him. It's how we thank him. It's how we praise him. It's how we share our innermost thoughts with him. Whatever it is that's on your heart or mind, no matter where you are, whether you're sitting, you're standing, you're kneeling, you're walking, you're driving, whatever you're doing, let your requests be made known to God and the peace which excels all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through his son, Christ Jesus. That's a promise from God. That's a promise. Do you believe it? Try it. Pray. Ask God to build your faith. Ask him to help you to have a prayer life. And then just simply take the time to do it. So my prayer is that you will do what Paul was saying to the Philippians, that you will let your requests be made known to God.